you know, rural medicine is just it's very difficult for these folks. And it's a really underserved area that we're focused on and passionate about trying to help. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Radiology Report podcast, where we are having conversations with the leaders transforming radiology today. You can find us on radiologyreportpodcast.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your host, Daniel Arnold. I'm delighted to be joined today by Bob Stilley. Bob is the founder and CEO of HeartCare Imaging and a very successful entrepreneur with decades of experience in medical imaging. He is also a passionate advocate of rural health access, so completely aligned with the mission of the show here around how we advance imaging outcomes, both domestically and abroad. And um, I'm just so excited to have Bob on the show today. Bob, welcome. Thank you. It's uh, quite a nice opportunity. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to be here. So we love on this show talking with entrepreneurs, especially successful founders who have had experience in the imaging space. So we're going to get into your background here. And and to start off, I just want to learn a little bit more about your early career. um, And then we'll get into a little bit more what drew you to imaging and what drew you to starting heart care. But but start us off at the beginning, you know, where where are you from and uh, what are some of the early uh, parts of your career? Well, I'm a Florida guy from Florida. I uh, went to the University of Florida and graduated quite a while back. And I hate to date myself as far as my early career, but I I guess I'll have to. I, um, out of college, went to work for Xerox, but not in the copier area, but in their computer division. And and, and yes, they did have one way back. And it was a small division of Xerox, very um, innovative, had some fantastic products, which they didn't appreciate. And um, we did well, very entrepreneurial division that ended up not being supported by Xerox. So a number of us left and went to work for a company called Technicare, which was a diagnostic imaging company based out of Cleveland. It was owned by Johnson & Johnson. And it was kind of a similar story to the Xerox where J&J was more of a product company versus a capital equipment product company. So we had MRI, early MRI, early nuclear medicine. Uh, they had a second CT that was uh, ever invented. Again, very entrepreneurial division that then was sold to uh, General Electric. And a group of us kind of said, enough, let's start our own company. And we started a company called Summit World Trade. And the idea was Summit was to bring products you know, from within the United States, from abroad, that was innovative, that were trying to get started. And uh, we had a sales team, a marketing team, engineering team, a service team. So we would get them started and then let them go on their own. And uh, we had some great products like Sofa Medical, which was a nuclear medicine company, Trionics, which was a, another nuclear medicine company based out of uh, Cleveland, Hologic, early days of Hologic, we brought them on board. And then we had a real um, home run, if you will, with Hitachi Medical, where we actually did a joint venture with them, where we brought in the open MRI. So that, that was uh, quite a bit of my career. I started out as a, like an area manager, went to a regional manager, vice president, and then president of, of various summit companies. I went back to the partners in the company that I had um, in the late 90s, and I said, you know, it's great that we're helping these companies out, but, you know, I, I see that when we put product, especially into physician practices or into smaller hospitals, they really struggle with implementation and then running it. And so I said, why don't we get into the operations side? And they didn't think it was a good idea. So they said, um, <laughs> good luck, Bob. <laughs> so in, in 98, I started heart care imaging, and, and the idea was to go ahead and um, work with physicians and hospitals to bring these products. And our, our first site was in uh, Edenton, North Carolina, a small coastal city on the Albemarle Sound. And they're still one of our customers today. And uh, we did a lot of nuclear cardiology at the time. We did a lot of university-based. Um, we have University of Florida as one of our clients, George Washington up in DC, um, some other ones throughout the US. And probably a little over 10 years ago, University of Florida was expanding into a rural uh, site in between Jacksonville and Gainesville. And they uh, brought us into that hospital to provide nuclear medicine services. And a lot of these hospitals don't have the ability to do that for a number of reasons. It went so well that we've expanded and expanded and expanded. And we found a real business opportunity, but more of a calling to help rural uh, health by providing not only nuclear medicine, but other diagnostic imaging services throughout the U.S. And We're in the Southeast, the Midwest, you name it, we're throughout the U.S. right now, all the different states. So that's where the company is today. 
really amazing story. And we'll, we'll get into heart care in a second, but I want to go back to your early career. What drew you to medical imaging? Was it obvious at that time how big medical imaging was going to be? And, and so you wanted to ride this wave of innovation or was there, you know, was it like, you know, people thought you were crazy and it was, you know, the Bitcoin of, of the early 90s, some some far flung technology that, that maybe has promise, but maybe it'll be nothing. You know, what was the industry like at that time? What drew you to it? Well, it, it was very innovative. You know, this goes even back a little bit further than the early 90s, unfortunately for me, but or fortunately, I guess, you know, MRI was in its heyday. It was it was just coming out. You know, there was resistive magnets, there were superconductive magnets, there, and then there were permanent magnets. CT was still relatively new. A lot of hospitals didn't have it. They had mobile CT servicing them. And the reason I think I got into the business was, you know, one opportunity, but I had a science background and a computer background. And if you look at the advances we've seen in imaging throughout the years, you know, there's certainly the technology from the hardware, the magnets and the CT scanners and the nuclear medicine cameras. But a big part of the advancement has been the advancement in computers, software, memory size that have allowed us to go from a single slice CT scanner to, you know, 256, 512 slice CT scanner today. And you can take that against across any modality. It's, it's really been why we've seen such great advances in the ability to diagnose patients with these different modalities. So you saw the technology that was changing and there was already quite a bit of activity and you thought there was a real growth potential here. And so you and your, your colleagues decided to go for it and start a, a distribution company. Yes. And, and especially at that time, Daniel, there, there were a lot of companies that they had great ideas and great products, maybe a three, four person operation engineering and, and some software support that didn't have the distribution capabilities. And so that's where we came in. How did you get the word out at that time? How did you help the Hitachis of the world distribute their technologies? What were you actually doing? Well, we keep in mind, we've been in the business for quite a while with Technicare. So we knew a lot of people throughout the US and the world for that matter. We had international distribution also at Technicare. So we knew a lot of the, the radiologists, the radiology managers, the CEOs of hospitals, and they trusted us. And so mm -hmm. we went in with a new product that maybe didn't have a track record of a, one of the larger manufacturers. And we said, this is, you know, really good and it's innovative and it's better. They would give us an audience and we could talk to them and then discuss whether it was going to fit their needs or not. And so were you then on the sales side, you know, trying to make these deals or was that more, you were managing a, a team of salespeople at, at that point? Well, I started out as a sales guy. Yeah. But when you start a small company, I'm sure you understand this at MRI Online, you, you kind of do everything. So you, you're touching the engineering side, you're touching the service side, you're, you're doing the sales. You have to kind of have wear many different hats. So we did a lot of everything when we were in the early days. But I started out with Technicare as a you know, sales guy, then you know, moved into regional management, then in vice president of a sales force, and then running a company. Interesting. So then at this point, you see some new opportunity, which I, as I understand it is, hey, let's not just sell the equipment, but let's help them run the equipment, help them run their operations because they can have a much better impact that, you know, some of these teams, they don't know how to do it or they don't have the right capabilities to do it. You said, I see an opportunities. Is that kind of the core thesis that you saw that you wanted to go test with, with hard care? Yeah, the, at the time, there were a lot of cardiologists that were buying nuclear medicine cameras, and they would put them in their office and hire a technologist, you know, try and get a license. And it's hard to explain, but you would just knowing how it should be done and watching how they were doing it. You know, after we made the sale, they struggled and, you know, they were still doing OK, but they could be so much more efficient, provide so much better patient care that it just was driving me crazy that, you know, I, we can make this better. <laughs> So that's what drove me to get into the business with them, just to really provide better patient care, make them more efficient. And to their benefit, I mean, they were going to have better patient care, but also hit their bottom line better for the, uh, the modality that they put in. So how did you get the courage to take the leap? What was your life like at that time? Were you married? Did you have kids? Were you, you know, taking on a big risk? What, what was it like, that decision? So at the time, yeah, I had a, a baby that was probably less than a year old, a mortgage and a, a great wife that believed in me and believed in what we wanted to do. And, you know, working for a company, I was a small partner in that company. And 
you have ideas that are good and they, you know, they can get shot down. So I, I wanted the ability to go ahead and make my own calls and do what I always thought was going to be the right thing. So I was in a position where the company I was running, it was time to move on to do something else with the company. It was just the right time. And an interesting aspect is after the first year, you know, my wife and I said, let's, you know, she was working, you know, we had our insurance through her. She was a great partner in that. And we said, let's look at after the first year and decide whether or not this is something we want to continue to do. So after the first year, we looked, probably made half as much money working for the other company, but it's just the freedom of making your own decisions and always doing what you consider to be the right thing it was just a freedom that I wanted to continue. And that's 20, almost 24 years ago now. Wow. Well, it sounds like it went well. I mean, making any money in your first year is pretty good. You know, I certainly wasn't making any money the first year I started, you know, MRI online and many of my entrepreneurial friends, you know, they're starting out and and really trying to get it going. So tell me a little bit more about that. Like, how'd you get started? What was the first thing you did? It sounds like you maybe had an early customer that maybe you could test with from your relationships. Um, yeah, it's all, all based on relationships. You know, once again, having been in the business for a long time, I knew a lot of people and I got the word out that this is what I wanted to do. And I was made aware of a cardiology group up in North Carolina that was thinking about adding nuclear medicine, but wasn't sure how to do it. And that was our first customer. And we met with them, installed the first system over Christmas that year, got fogged in at this little airport. It was just, just a great story. And and again, you know, we've expanded with them and uh, still work with them 24 years later. So it's, it's awesome. In fact, the, the technologist that we hired 24 years ago is still with us today. Amazing. I love that. So how has the mission and vision for heart care evolved in the 20 years that you started it? Well, we started focused mainly on nuclear cardiology and for a number of reasons. You know, I think any company needs to expand what they do. They can't be a, you know, just one product, one product line. So we, we always were looking for different things to do. And that was, we had to do something around 2006, 2007, reimbursement for nuclear cardiology got cut by 25%. So it really put a strain on you know, our, the people we were taking care of. Um, and then along came uh, the ability to work with UF in this rural hospital setting. So that allows us to get into, into the hospital setting. Also, when I started the business, you know, I thought we we're going to be working with small cardiology groups because that they seemed like they needed the most help. But we, we were lucky enough to get in with the universities, with Kaiser Permanente up in the D.C. area at the time, some really large players. And that showed me that this wasn't something that just small players needed. We could provide this service in a large organization. And again, just because we, we focused in on providing a service that might be one of many to them, but one to us, we can do a much better job and make it work for them economically and uh, also clinically. So that's how we expanded into not just the small cardiology groups, but the large university-based practices, as well as then getting into the hospital-based practices. Really interesting. So yeah, kind of leveling up over time from small clinics to you know larger and more complex customers. So I know University of Florida is one of your customers and one of the customers where you have a, a wide range of services that you offer them. And maybe you could talk through a little bit about how you work with them today so people can who are unfamiliar with, with heart care can really understand some more of the services that you offer and, and how it works. Right. So at the University of Florida, we, um, we started off providing nuclear cardiology services for them quite a while ago. They had purchased a camera, um, hired a technologist, and got a license and just wasn't working out. The technologist was telling them they could only do X number per day when you know clearly they could do more. And they were just struggling. So they, they contacted us and they said, can you help us? And we said, yes. Yeah. So we went in, evaluated what they were doing. They, they bought the wrong piece of the equipment, um, just wasn't a good well-run operation. So we took it over, changed personnel, bought another piece of equipment in, changed the whole process of how they were doing and doubled their volume that they could do in that site. In addition, you know, we, we worked with all the referring physicians in the area to make sure they understood that the service was available, you know, how they could order it, why it was the best in the area. And that went so well that then we started talking to them about doing other cardiovascular imaging. So we started doing their um, echo services. We did a mobile echo route to go out into the rural community. Gainesville's north central Florida. So it's a fairly large town, but in a very rural area. So we were going out to the smaller offices and smaller hospitals providing those services. And then that evolved into, let's take over the ECHO services for them and all their outpatient cardiology. So we do all their ECHO 
and their vascular imaging throughout the University of Florida and their outpatient arena. Wow. And you mentioned that by doing all this, one of the ways that you help is you really help them keep the costs down. Um, how is it that you're able to, to do that? Well, let me, let me switch over a little bit to the, to the rural medicine side. When we got into rural medical uh, with nuclear medicine, you know, nuclear medicine is a great modality. It's functional imaging, but it's not something that a 25-bed rural hospital can really support on a day-by-day basis. We had a site that we ended up taking over in Live Oak, Florida, that had bought a camera, hired a full-time technologist, and was just not doing well. So they ended up selling the camera and then letting the technologist go. And we went back to him. We said, you know, you can probably do this more on a part-time basis and, and let us help you grow the business. So we went ahead and put a camera in there um, and then got a technologist on a part-time basis and then went out and worked with the people in the community, the surgeons, the cardiologists, the family practice, the NPs, the PAs, to make sure they understood the how, when, and why you would order a nuclear medicine mm. study. And it's, it worked really well. We brought the cost on provide a service because we had a part-time technologist. We were able to buy equipment because we buy so much of it on a much better price than buying on a one-off. And then also on the supply side, as far as the isotopes go, because we, we work with that throughout the United States, you know, we know what they should be paying versus what a salesperson is going to come in and tell you. So we kept those costs down. So we've done that throughout the U.S. for all of our rural providers so that they can provide this service on an as-needed basis, and it helps the patient, keeps them local. It also helps the physicians so that they can make sure their patients are getting diagnosed. And it helps the hospital in that they can bring additional net revenue to the hospital that they can use to hire more nurses or more doctors or buy equipment. It's just been fantastic to see. I mean, as we've discussed earlier, and I know probably getting ahead of myself, but you know, rural medicine is just, it's very difficult for these folks. And it's a really underserved area that, that we're focused on and passionate about trying to help. You know, you're speaking our language. Our mission is to expand the reach of, of radiology access. And one of the ways that we do that is, is through education. And, and one of our core customers are doctors in rural hospitals who, you know, they don't have the luxury of just being subspecialized, you know, they might be one of only a few radiologists for a wide radius. And so they have to be specialists in cardiac imaging as well as neuro imaging. And and so training is one way that we can do that, but access to high quality technology and services is critical. You know, one of the things that it was really interesting talking through with you is how, you know, a patient where maybe they don't have access to this, their alternative is, okay, well, I'm in Wyoming, I guess I have to drive down to Salt Lake City. And you say, okay, well, a two hour drive, that's not that bad. Well, you know, you're sick, you might have to do it multiple times. And so then people just don't do it. And then you're cleaning up on the back end when they could have had some preventative medicine that could have really changed their trajectory. So, you know, the, the rural health impact is, is really interesting. What drew you to this? How did you find that, you know, this calling? Well, I think I mentioned we, we had the first relationship at a hospital in northeastern Florida. And it really opened my eyes. You know, I'd driven by these small hospitals for you know years and years and years and never really thought twice about them. But then once we started working with them, and, and I gotta tell you that the people that work at these hospitals, you know, they live in the town, they they care about the people that they're taking care of. They're just incredibly wonderful people to work with. And then you start thinking about the patient. You know, and, as you mentioned, you know, if you're a patient and it's going to take you two hours to drive somewhere, you know, one, you might not have transportation or, or B, you might need to have one of your family members take off work to go there. So what we were finding is these people were not getting the diagnostic imaging that they needed. And then they were showing it up at the ER in really bad shape. So that's what we wanted to prevent. And we felt we had a nice solution. It worked so well in the first hospital, we just kept promoting it and introducing it elsewhere. We don't really have a big sales team. So the word got out and it started being spread from one of our customers to another customer to another customer. They would say, hey, we, we started working with this company, HeartCare. They're amazing. They come in, they've helped our patients, they've helped our bottom line. Um, so as I mentioned, it, it's a calling that we're, we're trying to find more that we can do with them, not just on the nuclear medicine side and echo and vascular, but other modalities that we can help them. Well, and it's it's an incredible solution where you're keeping patients closer to home and the hospital gets to keep the patient. It's a much better patient experience, much better patient outcomes. 
much less complexity for the hospitals. They can actually run their operation and grow their revenues. It sounds like a, a very compelling model. What's next for, for heart care imaging? Well, we're continuing to push on the, on the rural side. You know, we opened up um, a new hospital out in Wyoming last month uh, in Oklahoma two months ago. We have one in Montana that's going to open up uh, next month. So we're, we're seeing a lot of activity out west. And one of the things that we do, once we put these in uh, to service, we're on site at least once a month with our, our team, providing the education to uh, the physicians that are local, to the um, community in large, you know, the, the patients. And then we go back to the regional providers so that if, you know, for instance, in Salt Lake City, there's some oncologists, we make sure that they understand that those patients in Afton, Wyoming, can have the studies done there so that they don't try to make them drive to Salt Lake City. So that, that, that's a continuing effort as far as what's going forward. But you know, we're looking for other ways to help them also. So if, you know, if they're looking at a mobile pet system and we find a way that we can put that in on a full-time basis, we'll go ahead and do that. But we're continuing to try and find other ways to help these hospitals. You know, uh, we've worked with the Brown Foundation to make sure that they understand that there's some ways that we can provide help on mammography. That's a, another thing that, that we see rural health that doesn't get a lot of focus. And we know that that's something that we can help. So anything that, that we can provide them as far as um, information, whether it you know, brings revenue to our company or not, we're, we're trying to do it. We provide a rural roundtable on a quarterly basis where we bring in different speakers to let them know about physician recruitment, um, CT scanning, et cetera. Really interesting. Were there any moments in your entrepreneurial journey where you thought, oh boy, this might not work or any, any harrowing fork in the road type decisions that you faced? Well, there's, there's lots of ups and downs in running a business. Uh, you know, certainly when reimbursement was cut, that was a, a gotcha moment. I, one of the stories that I, I don't know if this is really a good story to tell on this podcast or not, but right before the pandemic, you know, I'm, I'm getting to the age where you start getting these calls from venture capitalists that, hey, why don't you sell your company? You know, we give you multiples, you're EBITDA. And so you entertain them. And we came really close to selling the company to a group of people that are trying to roll up a bunch of companies in the diagnostic imaging marketplace. And something just didn't feel right. So we said no I mean, at the very last hour. And then the pandemic hit. And I, I, I looked at Mary Lynn, my wife, and I was like, my goodness, man, that was a bad decision. But, but we fought really hard and, and, you know, and we knew we were doing the right thing. We, we went back to all of our customers as an aside. We didn't charge them for a couple of months because they couldn't pay us. So we could have charged them anyway. It wouldn't have mattered. But after getting through the pandemic and then watching what happened to the companies they rolled up and, and what they did to them, it was clearly the right decision. And, and it convinced me that hard care, we've been here for 24 years. I want to be here for another 24 years, whether I'm here or not. I want our company and our, our philosophy and, and our mission to, to continue to grow. So we're, it was a good lesson to learn. Hard during 2020, but overall, really a good one. I think that's a great story for the podcast. Thanks for sharing it. So uh, what's the MRI? What's the CT for tomorrow? You know, you started your journey, you and I were chatting. And it's so interesting hearing about your career, because Xerox, many people listening, you know, the younger generation might not know, was one of the most innovative companies in Silicon Valley at that time. And I started my career at Google. And so you and I were both drinking from the fire hose of, of technology and innovation. And then um, you saw the power of this new hardware combined with this faster computing and what it was going to do for imaging. And, and you rode that wave for people starting their career now. What's the next wave? What, what are you excited about? Well, I think theranostics, there, you know, there's ways now that we can treat cancer by going directly to the tumor. So you treat the tumor with radioisotope versus um, treating the whole body and, and hoping you get, get the cancer. There's a product now that's focused on part of the pancreatic cancer, not the, the big one we hear, but it's been very successful um, in eradicating that with in metastatic patients. And there's another one coming out now for prostate cancer. But I, I think that from our standpoint, that, that's where I think we're going to see some awesome patient care. And we're really excited about that. Exciting. Any advice for people thinking about starting a company today? You have to, one, believe in yourself, right? You know, we have five core values in our company. And, and the one that, that, that's made the most impact, I think, on every employee we have, and certainly on myself, is, is do the right thing. 
And if, if you want to live by doing the right thing, whether it means um, bring additional money into your pocket or really just taking care of your customer and, and foregoing that money because it's the right thing to do, then you'll be successful. If you go into it just because all you care about is making money, you might be successful, but it, you know it's not going to be that fulfilling and you're probably not going to do a great service to our, our community. Bob, one of the things that you do in your role is spend a lot of time talking to radiologists, which is our core audience. What advice do you have for radiologists today, you know, who are trying to build their careers and trying to be competitive in, in today's market? What are some of the trends that you're seeing? Well, I, th I think that what we've seen over the, the past number of years is radiologists have become specialists. You know, they're interventional, they're mammo, they're nuclear medicine. And, you know, from the rural standpoint, and I, I think even I, I serve on a board of a, a fairly large regional medical center here, what we need are radiologists that can do more than just, you know, one thing, and they can read CT, MR, nuclear med, maybe do some interventional work. And that, I think, will make the radiologists so much more valuable, not only within the system they're in right now, but if they choose to go somewhere else, they'll have so many more opportunities. Yeah. And it's an interesting time because over 98%, I think, of radiologists in the U.S. do a subspecialty, but over 85% bill across multiple specialties. And so people are getting really subspecialized and they want to read in the area of specialization. But, you know, if you want to run a private practice and support a hospital, you're going to need to read you know, you need to do call and you're going to need to support in the women's imaging center and you're going to need to do some cardiac nuke meds and, you know, a bunch of stuff that maybe you did in residency, but then you kind of lose. And so it's one of the reasons why we think training is, can be really helpful for folks to stay up to date in these fields. Cause one of the things that's happening is that the change is happening really fast. And so you can feel like, well, I'm not up to speed in these areas. And so that's where uh, we think our tools can be quite helpful. And, and I, the other thing I'll add to that is that having been in the industry for decades, the one thing I've admired about physicians as a whole desire to continually learn, you know, they're, they're students forever. And so it, you might be specialized in one thing, but you know, you can continue to learn other parts of, of the modality that you're in. And that's, that's what you guys provide. So I think that that would be um, something that pretty much every physician I, I talk to would want to continue to do. So, I mean, I think, I think we talked a lot about how, the company does good. But if you want to talk a little bit about your philanthropic areas, we can talk about that if that's something that you think is core and important to share. You know, we, on our 401k plan, we, we've we given people 5% every year, regardless, no matching needed. It was just something we've we've always done. If, we, if we've had the money, only time we didn't do it was in 2020, we did smaller because we just had the money. We've given probably 20% plus of our net revenue to charities every year. Um, over the holidays, we did like a 15 days of giving where we give money to different charities our employees can pick. Our philosophy on employees is that, you know, we want the best. If you get into the fight where you're trying to have them pay at the top tier, it's kind of hard because that keeps changing. We always want them at the top 20%, you know, so we keep range on that so that they're up there. I came here from uh, Jupiter Hospital. We had a new marketing guy in there. He's talking about this new capitalism where they, you know, everybody shares and everything like that. And, and he's talking about all the different people that compete for the money. And I've never looked at it that way in our company. Is we kind of, I know this sounds, I'm not certainly not a socialist by any stretch, but we share what we make. I mean, it's because I figure, you know, everybody's working hard, you know, depending on, you know, what you contribute, you're going to get your fair share back. So I'm rambling a little bit, but uh, we, we give a lot back. And then also, you know, once I got the company running, you know, I was on the board of Florida Atlantic University for 15 years. I was chairman there. Um, I was chairman at Jupiter Medical Center. I'm now vice chair there. I'm on the University of Florida Cancer Leadership Council. I'm on the, we're selecting a new president at University of Florida. So I'm on the selection committee. So I get a lot of time back also. Um, I coached softball teams. It just, you, you know, you have to give give your time back. I mean, that's, and that's kind of what we do. I mean, the amount of your company that you're sharing, not just with your employees, but with the community through nonprofit is, is an astounding number. And going back to the discussion about potentially selling your business, you know, I could see how you'd want to keep it private. 
you know, one of the well, benefits of calling the shots is it will. So th- that, honest to goodness, in 2020, I looked at Maryland, I was like, oh man, <laughs> what did we do? And then, you know, then you just, then you just suck it up, right? And you go, okay, let's, let's figure this thing out. And you we came out of it so much better on the other side. And the team also just really, really rallied. But I, I, went, I have this Bible verse on my, on my desk that somebody gave me, it says, for whom, whoever much is given of him so much will require. And, and I believe that, you know, just if you're given a lot, which I have been, you're required to give stuff back. So that's, that's kind of what runs the company. Anything else to hit, Bob? Anything we didn't cover that you'd like us to? The only thing we didn't cover um, that we do, we really focus on, I think I did talk a little bit about this, Daniel, is that once we put these systems in, whether it's at the university level or at the, um, especially at the rural level, we support the heck out of them. I mean, be, before they go in, we're pretty sure they're going to be successful financially because we don't want them to get in there and you know get a call a year later and have to pull it out. But then we work with them to educate their, their physicians and their PAs and their MPs and the people in the community. We'll, we'll put ads in the newspaper saying, hey, you know, you have this nuclear medicine service at your hospital. So if your doctor orders this, remember, you can have it done at home. So we try to make sure that anything that's done in that, if a study's ordered in that town, or even from a patient that lives in that town, it's done there. Because that's, you know, that's easier on the patient. It's better for the hospital. And then the, there's a lot of downstream revenue that runs from that. For instance, if you have a HIDA scan, which is you know, for, for gallbladder, if it's positive and they have surgery at the hospital, they'll keep the surgery at the hospital. So there's additional patient care and then revenue that they're going to be able to keep there. So it's just it's been such a great success story for these hospitals. And we meet with them you know, on a quarterly basis just to review everything. And I mean, they just tell us, thank you for being here. It's just like, it's just a great feeling. And um, so that, that's why we're so passionate about really making a difference. I love that. Well, Bob, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed the conversation and I know our listeners will too. Thank you. I hope I didn't talk too much, but uh, I certainly appreciate the opportunity to tell my story. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Radiology Report podcast. Be sure to visit us at the radiologyreportpodcast.com or subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts to join us for our next episode. We are always looking for great guests. If you have someone you'd like to hear on the show, please get in touch with us online.